we discussed earlier. After your presentation, would you like to say a few words about the Spanda sculpture you created in Perth, Australia, and is reference to the Kashmir Shaiva Zoo? So basically, we are also looking at how Indian culture, and any, any aspect of Indian culture, philosophy, has also spread across the world, thanks to the works of some of these uh, eminent speakers that we're going to have today. Thank much for the invitation. Namaste, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here with you all on this panel. Uh, and um, so, uh, as was mentioned, I'm going to be talking about uh, Matyendranath, the Mahasiddha, and the sculpture which, uh, which I created in his honor. Um, so, when I started to uh, when I started to learn about the life and the teachings of of, uh, of Matienda Nat, uh, I began to realize at once how uh, significant he is in, in the history of yoga, um, and at the same time how overlooked he is in contemporary yoga communities. So, the reason uh, why I started to create this sculpture, uh, and also the reason for giving this talk, is to bring his life to light, um, as well as to bring his enlightened nature to life. So um, I'm speaking from the position of an artist, uh, and I'll be sharing some of the research and the introspection that I went through to capture the essence of this great yogi in sculptural form. So what we know about uh, Matien Renat is that he lived uh, in Assam in around between, sometime between the, tenth, the, the seventh and the tenth century. Uh, in the Hatha Yoga Pradipika, uh, which is sort of the root text about Hatha Yoga, uh, he's praised as the very first yogi who taught the knowledge of Hatha Yoga. Um, in the Tantra Loka uh, by Vinavagupta, he's honored as the father of yoga and also the founder of the Kala tradition. Uh, in an ancient text called the uh, Chaturashiti Siddha Pavriti, we have the story of Matyendranath uh, actually written uh, and mythology of Matyendranath. So that's, I'd like to share that with you uh, with you now. Matyendranath was born in eastern India and was a fisherman by caste. At some distance from Kamarupa, there was an ocean where he caught fish and sold them at the local market. One day he caught a very huge fish, and when he tried to draw it out of the ocean, he was not able to, and instead the fish dragged him deep down into the water. The fish swallowed him whole, but he was protected by his good karma and he did not die. At the very same time, the goddess Shakti was asking Shiva to narrate her lessons of Dharma, to which he answered that his teaching was very secret, and not just for anybody, he said, make a house deep in the ocean where nobody will listen to us, and I will initiate you there, he told her. The goddess did this, and after they both reached this place at the ocean floor, Ashiva started his lesson. But while he was speaking, the fish, who had swallowed the fisherman, swam by and stopped right beneath the underwater house that the goddess and Shiva were sitting in. Shiva had not finished his lesson yet, but the goddess became overpowered by sleep. Shiva, however, continued narrating, and he asked the goddess if she was following his teachings. And it was, in fact, the fisherman who, listening from the stomach of the fish, answered, yes, I, I understand. So when Shiva completed his teaching, the goddess awakened and confessed, I was listening up until some moment, but then I fell asleep. And puzzled, Shiva asked her, then who was it that said that I, that I understood? Uh, Shiva then saw that it was the man who was inside the fish who had ho heard the whole teaching. And since he had heard this whole teaching, Shiva initiated him and ordered him to do his practice inside the fish for, t for 12 years. One day, another fisherman caught that big fish and dragged it out of the water. Seeing its unusual heaviness, they thought it might have gold or silver in its stomach. They took it out of the water, cut open its belly, and saw a man sitting there inside. And shocked, the fisherman asked the man who he was. The fisherman asked the man who he was. And the man answered, I was a fisherman like you. This fish dragged me into the ocean and swallowed me whole for 12 years. Everyone was greatly astonished to see this event. And from that moment, he became famous and known as Matyendranath, 
Lord of the Fishes. And people praised him, and immediately he started dancing. As he danced, his feet entered deep into the earth, as if it were wet, and he sang, because of previously accumulated good karma and the power of chanting the sacred mantra, I have attained realization. He then spent 500 years performing various deeds to uplift humanity. So this, this is the mythology, the story uh, of Matsyendra Nath. Uh, and obviously, when we reflect on this story, uh, it's, it's not to be taken literally. Um, this, man, uh, this man did not actually live inside a fish for 12 years. It's mytho this is mythology, and it points to some deep truth. And um, there are many diff there are different interpretations of this myth. For me, the most compelling interpretation that I've come to uh, is that the fish is, is the vehicle of spiritual practice, uh, yoga and meditation, that which brings us into the most deepest, most sacred place within ourselves, to the oceanic depths of our own being. And so Matyendra Nath, he heard the Lord speak in secret uh, and in a quiet place at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, and in this sense, uh, we can understand the myth is demonstrating that when we recede uh, into our inner being, into that secret place, uh, we can hear sacred knowledge. And uh, in Sanskrit, there's a beautiful word for this. It's uh, shruti, uh, that which is uh, heard by revelation. Okay, so uh, during my research, uh, I studied many different representations of Matsyendra Nath, and there are many throughout history in different uh, traditions uh, to get a sense of how he's being traditionally portrayed. Uh, this uh, ecstatic dance posture that you can see uh, here is characteristic of Mah Mahasiddha representations throughout history. Um, it's a way of showing their, their unity with the force of life um, and their state of ultimate freedom. Uh, so that's a front view. I'll show you another view. Uh, and so there's another interpretation, which I like to mention, of the myth of Matsyendra Nath. And, that is that this, this swallowing into the belly of the fish is at once a macrocosmic map of the subtle body, anatomy, um, as well as an explanation of a very specific yogic practice whereby the downward flow of prana uh, is actually reversed and moves back up the central channel. Um, it requires more explanation. It's quite fascinating. I won't go into it right now, but um, suffice to say that this in this posture, um, in this posture, this posture is referred to as Bujanga uh, Lalitam, the serpent's play. So in this posture, I've, I've attempted to give form to that, uh, to the arising of Kundalini, which is um, a goal and a potential result of the, of the Hatha Yoga practice, uh, which Matsyendra Nath um, taught, and which we practice today too. Um, so you'll see that he's adorned with all the hallmarks of a Shaivite Yogi. Uh, he has dreadlocks in his body, um, he has these thick uh, earrings pierced through the concha right here, which is characteristic of the Nat uh, lineage. Image, he has the Tripundra, this mark uh, of, of holy ash from the sacred fire, and it's traced along the forehead like that and along the arms, and it represents the threefold powers of, of Shiva. And for those who apply the mark, it's a reminder of the spiritual aims in life, um, the truth that the body and material things will someday just turn to ash, and uh, that liberation uh, in this life is a worthy goal. Uh, so uh, representations such as, as this um, are important for us to have, not only uh, because uh, we should know about the roots of yoga, uh, where these teachings come from and uh, where are the authentic, um, where is the authentic lineage. Um, but also, uh, also as a way to have reflected back to us. And I thought that it had a lot of uh, Shaivism in it, Kashmir Shaivism in that. Uh, would you like to elaborate on your thoughts behind it? And what made you select that particular uh, aspect of sculpture? Sure. Well, I'm very inspired by the teachings of Kashmir Shaivism. And um, when I saw that site, I could feel that there was a real potential there to create an icon which would completely open up uh, the, the sort of the heart of the city. And um, so this Spanda principle in Kashmir Shaivism is sort of the, is the pulsation of consciousness between uh, the absolute and the relative and between form and no form. 
And uh, I thought that was, uh, it, it, this banda, the word spanda is, is, it refers to a vibration. And so I, I tried to conform to that, to that principle in a sense uh, of a vibratory force between the unmanifest and the manifest. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's it. And then coming to one last point, you have lived in Australia, you have lived in the United States, and I'm sure you would have traveled to other parts of the world. What exactly do you think has the spread of uh, Indian philosophy, religious symbols, spread across the world thanks to some of the work, work by artists like you? Uh, sorry, could you repeat the question? Now, now, you have been living in Australia and the United States, and I'm sure you would have traveled to a lot of other countries. Do you think the Indian philosophy, the religious symbols, and various other aspects of India, have they been spreading across the Western world? And have they ever had any influence in those countries? Yes, I see that they are. Uh, they are very, um, they're very pervasive and becoming more and more so, and especially with the spread of, of, uh, of yoga. I mean, this is one way that the teachings are spreading. And, and, and I'll add that it's also, it's very important in that sense that we trace back the roots and that we're also faithful to the authentic traditions of yoga. Um, and uh, because it's it's fast moving throughout the world, for sure. And it's important for it to, for us to retain its integrity and, and be, be conscious of that. Sure. Um, I, I love what you said, Sri Kumar, uh, about the, this quote that, that, I, that I've heard before, too, about the architecture is frozen music. It's very beautiful and very evocative. Uh, and so uh, for me, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's interesting in terms of sculpture, too, because it's inherently static. Sculpture is inherently still. Uh, and so the challenge for me in representing this this, uh, this Siddha, who is who, who's integrated his state of realization into the world to such a degree that he's uh, he's really become the laws of nature. Um, part of the challenge to represent that was to integrate that dynamism within the stillness of the medium of sculpture. So um, uh, that was the challenge, and also the 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 interesting part of the part of trying to evoke uh, the, the nature of this of this siddha to have both the element of stillness and and dynamism at the same time <laughs>